It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood. A neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? Once again, the question is probably, who is my neighbor? Well, we're going to talk about that a bit more this morning. But we want to make sure that each of you can find somebody, not your friend from a different church, because we're not trying to transplant people from one church to another, but somebody maybe that doesn't know God or hasn't worshipped in a while or doesn't attend this church because they haven't taken the opportunity to worship, and we want you to invite them on September 17th to come and worship with us. So last week I began sharing with you about how to be a good neighbor and gave the reminder that in God's neighborhood, everyone belongs and there is no discrimination. This week, I want to share again on the importance of loving not only God, most of us get along with God and we can love God, but on loving our neighbors also the importance of loving other people, which can't be overstated because Jesus placed it right up there, just as important as loving God. So I want to start this week uh, as I introduce, introduce the idea I call expanding our family. I got to tell you, I saw a very touching film. It was a film about an older gentleman who had grown kind of bitter. He was by himself and uh, he had a lot of knowledge and specific knowledge to help people, but didn't apply it. And a girl came along who didn't have anyone to care for her and was brought into his life. And he began to raise her. He began to share his knowledge with her. He began to train her and eventually uh, kind of took her in and gave her a lot of guidance. And when I saw that film, I thought for sure, it's just confirmation that I had to preach on this topic. So I want to give a nod to the tender-hearted, um, delicate film titled Logan. But maybe, maybe the book of James from our biblical focus makes this point even more plain when talking after Jesus physically left the earth about what religion looks like. And the author of James puts it this way, a religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And Stephanie shared that with us as our biblical focus, but it just puts it right out there. So maybe you're going to sleep through the rest of my message, or maybe you really want to sneak out the back doors. Take that verse with you if you do. But when we think about broken families, when we think about fatherlessness or motherlessness, when we think about divorce and we think about poverty, when we think about substance abuse and we think about incarceration, homelessness, and teenage pregnancy, domestic abuse, gang violence, food insecurity, human trafficking, the rise in violent crimes, when we think about all those really pleasant and uplifting things, I know. That's a terrible list of stuff, but when you think about all of those, who pays the highest price when that happens? Who pays the highest price for all those problems? It's children, and it's those that don't have the means or the ability to care for themselves. But this isn't just something that we find in our times. This isn't new. This didn't just happen since the news obsessed over covering these kind of stories or since we've had the internet. This has been going on a long time. In reality, it's been happening for thousands of years, and you can go as far back as Old Testament times. We find one of the psalmists crying out to God in this way. See if this doesn't sound familiar. God, defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the needy and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Isn't that kind of the sentiment that we express in some way or that we feel inside? Maybe not with those exact words. But if you were going to pray when you see some of these heartbreaking stories or you watch this happen in real life, isn't that the sentiment that we get to? God, 
help these people when they can't help themselves. God, for those that can't care for themselves, please care for them. God, do something about this situation. So that's what I want to share with you about today. Expanding the family is including those people that might not be able to care for themselves. And how do we do that? And should we do that? And the answer up front is yes. But I found a little known piece of Scripture, at least I don't think this is one I remember learning about as a child. It's one that I don't see come up very often. And it tells a really cool story about one instance where this type of care is extended. It's from 2 Samuel chapter 9. And just to give you a little background about it, um, King Saul, King Saul was the first king over Israel when they decided they needed to elect a king. They wanted a ruler. They looked around at the other lands and they said they all have kings. They have a person they can follow. Excuse us, God, but we'd like a person to look to also. So they elected King Saul. Well, King Saul had a grandson. And when his kingdom was invaded, King Saul had been killed and his son had been killed and the caretaker was carrying this grandson and, of course, fleeing and dropped the child and fractured its legs. The child's name was Mephibosheth. Go ahead and name your next child Mephibosheth or recommend it to a friend. But that's the backdrop is this is King Saul's grandson had been dropped, you know, as they were fleeing and legs were shattered and without the medical technology we have today, that was a lifelong problem. So in 2 Samuel 9, uh, the story goes like this. David asked his court, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for my friend Jonathan's sake? The servant Ziba answered him, There's still a son of Jonathan, but he's lame in both feet. So King David had him brought to his throne room, and when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed to pay honor to him as king. And David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, who am I, your servant, that you should notice a dead dog like me? The king summoned the servant Ziba, Saul's steward, and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. Now you and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him, bring in the crops, and take care of your master's grandson that he may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. You have to appreciate the perspective of Mephibosheth there who thinks I'm a nobody. You know, the question like, who am I that you should notice a dead dog like me? That's strong to read it in words. But the reality is a boy without a parent in those times was of no real value to anyone. I'm not promoting that as a mindset for today. But I'm saying that's how they were viewed back in the time. There was no inheritance that this child could have to be wealthy or to survive on on their own. So they were a burden to society. Children were not viewed the same then as they are today. If they could not be trained to take over a family business, if they were not equipped to be placed into the army, they would likely end up being a beggar. They could possibly hope, pray, that someone would allow them to come and be a servant, but they would not be accepted in like family, and they would not be earning an incredible income and self-sufficient, they would be a slave, a servant. On top of that, this particular child, Mephibosheth, as we mentioned, had both legs crushed, was crippled in both feet. So what kind of a military personnel would that make? It's not going to happen. It just wasn't going to happen at that time. What kind of servant would that make in those days? Again, nobody wants a servant like that. So Mephibosheth's future is pretty bleak. Mephibosheth didn't have a lot of options or a lot of hope. Mephibosheth was probably lucky that there was a servant to carry him out when the invading people came or he would have been slaughtered. Mephibosheth had a bleak future, but something changed his fortune. 
Something happened very near to Charles Dickens' novel, Great Expectations, that gave him an incredible outcome. And what was it that changed the outlook for this particular child? In that story, what made the difference? Do I need to read it again? Go ahead. What made a difference there? What changed Mephibosheth's fortune? Yeah, the king of all people, someone, but the king specifically, took him in and cared for him. King David, because of his friend Jonathan, and he wanted to honor someone, said, I will take you in. I will provide caretakers for you. I will make sure your land is farmed and you can eat at my table. Now, even the wealthy in the kingdom wouldn't get to dine at the king's table, but David did that for this individual. Don't you think that was a kind, a gracious, a generous, and a loving act to care for a child in that way? It wasn't David's child. It wasn't a child that would be of incredible value to him that could do things and repay him somehow. Don't you find that to be a generous thing to do? I think so. So again, when we look around our world today and we see parents that are passed out on the road with children and strapped in a car seat and they've OD'd on some drug or they're absolutely just strung out on it. When we hear of mothers who've had five or six different boyfriends and therefore five or six different children and none of them have any idea who their real father is. When we hear about fathers abusing children, locking them in rooms, fracturing their bones, and they have no power to stop it. When we hear about things similar, we feel similar to that passage that I read for you earlier. God, defend the weak and the fatherless. God, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. And we pray that God will truly show up for them. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what God's plan is to accomplish this? I mean, in real life, let's get out of the biblical time and today's world When you hear of those things, or maybe you see those things, or maybe that goes on in the house next to you, and you think to yourself, God, step in and help this situation. What do you think God's plan is to care for people in that situation? Thank you. Who said that? Bonus point to Melanie this morning. It's us. God's plan has been since the Old Testament early times In fact, you can go back to the second book of the Bible and you can find that God issued a command for God's people to care for the orphans and the widows. And in today's world, who are God's people? It's the church. It's those that know Jesus Christ, try to follow God's ways and are to live it out in the world. When we see those things that break our hearts and scream, this is wrong, and we feel torn because the children involved or the widows involved don't have the power to do anything about it, God's plan has always been and still is for the church to provide care for those that cannot care for themselves. So the question might be, well, how do we identify? Pastor Devin, okay, I hear what you're saying, but how can I identify someone that might need help like that? I think the question in that passage that King David asked might just get our minds going. As he sat there being king of Israel, as he sat there having won a major battle, as he sat there looking over his kingdom, King David asked his servants, is there anyone left that I can show kindness to for the sake of my friend? And that's what brought about this whole uh, assistance that he gave to Mephibosheth. Just like King David cared for him, Who can you care for? Maybe as an act of remembrance or gratitude for someone that helped care for you. Who can you say, there's someone that I need to love because I know I was loved in this way. Maybe you had a friend whose dad spent a lot of time with you when your dad wasn't there or maybe you didn't have a dad. But that friend and his father always stepped in for you. Can you be a dad to someone like that? Maybe it's a coach. You were on a team and you felt like you didn't get a lot of guidance, but there was a coach that stepped in to help you not only with the sport, but to help you in the game of life. And that coach gave you so much life advice, you're just deeply thankful to them. Who can you coach like that? Who can you share advice with? 
maybe, wait for it, there was a neighbor that was always there for you. Kind of like Wilson from uh, Home Improvement back in the day that always looked over the fence and gave helpful advice. Maybe there's a neighbor. When you were growing up, you remember, okay, you had your family, but in addition to that, neighbor X was always looking out for you, helping you when you were worried. Maybe that neighbor was there when you fell and got really hurt and they looked after you. Who can you be a neighbor to like that? I see, I see this and I love it and my daughters are practicing this right now. There's a family, I don't know honestly if they're new, I should know my neighbor better. I don't know if they're new or if children have recently moved in, uh, but at some point in the summer, all of a sudden, it just seemed out of the blue one day, two little girls were running around the yard and the trees that were chopped down after the wreck from the storm, they're coloring with chalk on the trees and they see our badminton net and they're running around looking at it like, what is it? And to me, as my kids grow, other children just look smaller. So I think they're each about this big. They must be like half a day old. But nonetheless, they're running around and they're just everywhere. And my girls, much older than them, went out and set up a bubble blowing station and a chalk drawing station and got the badminton rackets out and welcomed them. And at first I'm like, hey, 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 they're going to destroy our badminton set. Hey, wait a minute. They're going to cover up my beautiful drive. It's not that beautiful, so I guess that's okay. But, you know, and then I look at what they're doing, and I see them being neighbors. It's not that they're thinking these are the best playmates we could ask for. You know, they're exactly our age, and they share our interests. I think they just went out to be better neighbors, and that's awesome. But asking that question, because someone did this for me, who can I go and pay that back to helps identify who it is you can be a better neighbor to. So the next question might be, well, what ways can I really help? I mean, what's out there? How can I make a difference? There's a lot of ways. And I'm glad that I asked because I'm assuming some of you were asking. It can be certainly not for everyone, but adoption is an option, right? There are so many children in foster care that need someone to care for them, adoption is out there and that's a great way to extend love to someone. But again, I know that's not for everyone. I read a cool thing though. There was a really large church, a mega church. You know, there's big churches and there's mega churches. It was like a mega, mega church. And the pastor challenged them. They said, by next year at this time, can we have signed up somebody to parent every child that's in the local system? I thought, wow. I'm not pushing that here. I'm not going to promote that, but what a cool challenge to say that that's our job enough that we could step out and in a mega, mega church, we could make it so that every child has someone that calls them family. I thought that was cool. But again, maybe it's not something that large. Did you know at the elementary school, which if you just walk a couple of blocks, is right there in our community, did you know at the elementary school, they have a mentoring program? I went and I signed up for that, and I was really pleased to see a couple of you from this church there also. I think everybody can sign up to be a mentor. It's easy. Go and spend lunchtime with a child and teach them whatever you have to know or listen to them. Just be a friend to them. Maybe instead of getting upset when kids run around the neighborhood, you flip it and do an act of kindness towards them. If they're kind of troublesome or they're always in your yard or they're making a mess of this and that, instead of going out and being the uh, proverbial, you know, like, hey, get off my lawn, like, bring them a slice of pizza. Ask them what their names are and get to know them. You can be, again, that cool neighbor that they look up to. You could be a respite worker, whether that's formally or informally. You can be a respite worker. There are people that are constantly giving care to others. Who gives care to them? You can offer a break. There are formal programs to go through, but maybe you know somebody. It's just having to constantly give care for someone else, and you could give them relief. You could support the children's ministries here at the church. We have Noah's Ark that happens, and we just rounded up a new group of leaders for Noah's Ark. We have our nursery, and again, Kristen Reel has been so faithful there, but it's time for us to look for another person as she's ready to move on. We have Genesis Club for the upper elementary age children. We have our, our Friends Club, the uh, midweek programming. 
Those are all opportunities that you can step in. And just so you know, here's a free tidbit of information I won't even charge you for. When you hear youth and you hear children, you think, yeah, but I've got to be young to do that. You're wrong. I don't mean to embarrass anyone, but I'm just going to say Keith and Anna's Flora have been two of this church's largest supporters of our youth program in a number of ways. They're not leading the youth activities, but they are supporting it. And hey, everyone can support those programs through prayer. And here's another cool idea. When I was part of the uh, district interview team for pastors and lay leaders and local pastors, I don't remember, four times a year, uh, we'd come and interview them and ask how it's going and just you know try and listen to them and provide feedback for them on how their church work was going. I talked with and I was just inspired by this church lay leader who came in and it wasn't time for his interview. He was waiting, but he knew I was one of the interviewees. Our previous candidate was done. So I was making conversation with him, trying again to have a normal conversation as opposed to him feeling like, oh, I got to interview this guy. And I just said, tell me what's fun in church. Tell me what you enjoy. This gentleman was somewhere in his 60s. And he said, oh, I'll tell you what I love. You always like to listen to that. He says, I'll tell you what I love. We have a men's group at our church. I'm like, okay. He said, what we do is two times a month, every other week, our men's group, we have individuals that we took on as mentors. And we try and teach them a life skill or a life lesson. And he shared those with me. I'm like, wow. So they got together and formed a men's group with the idea that they would take specific individuals and add to their lives. Like if nothing else, that men's group was going to make sure they were caring for some of these kids' lives. What an amazing thing. How simple would it be? If I switch gears for a bit, those are some ideas to help care for children. I want to say this, that sometimes we hear orphans and we think of those that truly have no parents. Sometimes the orphans in today's world are those that are being raised by their grandparents because their parents had them before they were ready to parent a child. Sometimes the orphans are the ones that have a mom and dad, but the mom and dad are so addicted to a substance they don't even remember they have children. Sometimes the orphans are the ones, again, that have parents, but the parents simply don't care for them. In Liberty Center, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, There were three kids that were always around the church. They threw stones through the church basement windows multiple times. They'd come in and they'd grab donuts when we had like donuts for our fellowship time. They'd grab the donuts and they'd run out the back. And at first, I was that proverbial person like, until I found out what was going on at their home. I knew they had a mom and I knew they had a dad. In reality, they didn't have either. They were raising themselves. Just one story. There was a list so terrible. It's just the things that happened were heartbreaking. But just one story. Parents decided we want to do some shopping. We're going to Fort Wayne for the afternoon. Locked the kids out of the house. The afternoon turned into the evening and the evening turned into the night. They were locked out of their house and left the entire day. When you hear the term orphan, I don't mean always literally has no parents. But sometimes in so many other ways, there are children that need guidance in their lives. God, it says in Ephesians chapter 1, God destined us to be His adopted children through Jesus Christ because of His love. I want you to hear that again. If you call yourself a Christian, if you say, yes, I know God as my Father, God destined us to be His adopted children through Jesus Christ because of His love. It's not because we were so great that God said, I'll take you in. It's not because God owed us. You know, God created the world and on the seventh day, He kind of left an IOU because He couldn't think of what else to do. But God destined us to be His adopted children. In other words, God calls us sons and daughters and brought us into His family because of His love through Jesus Christ. Can we be like God and care for others that can't care for themselves the same way? 
If you want to be a better neighbor, and if you want to know who you can be a neighbor to, the people of God, today's church, always have been and still are God's plan for caring for those that can't care for themselves. Who is it because of the love and the kindness shown to you or because you feel so blessed by what you had that you can include and reach out to his family also? So once again, that brings us to our tip of the week. Now, I want you to remember that. I want you to focus on that. I want it to ruminate in your minds. I want you to look around and ask, who can I care for? Who can I bring in? Who can I show kindness to because of what someone did for me? But I want to give you a practical tip also in church for the Sunday that we're inviting people to be here. Okay? Last week, I talked about making space in the pews. Great to invite people in, and then if you don't move, they feel awkward and they stand in the aisle. Nobody wants people standing in the aisle this week. Here's a tip. If you were going somewhere for the first time, and you walked in, and nobody really said anything to you, but you were able to sit down and participate in whatever was going on, you'd feel okay. Because you got to be there. You got to join in. Tip of the week. If you walked in, and somebody shook your hand and welcomed you at the door, if there were refreshments that you were invited to partake of, and if multiple people, when, oh, for instance, if there were a greeting time, found you as a newcomer and said, I'm so glad you're here, wouldn't you feel a whole nother level of welcome? That's your job. On September 17th, when we shake hands, don't go and shake everybody that you're sitting with hands. Find somebody you don't know and shake their hands and get to know them. Maybe we can have some refreshments out. It'd be great for people to feel extra welcome because they were able to have a donut and some juice or something. And maybe instead of just getting as fast as you can into the pew and when church is out, bang, you're out the door, maybe you can talk a couple extra minutes and help somebody to feel like they were met and greeted and welcomed here at the church. Tip of the week.